we have a very short presentation. You really want to get to question and answer really quick because, you know, uh, for many of you, brownfields are new. And so, and for some of you, brownfields are confusing or maybe you don't misunderstand it. So it's about really your projects and not so much just about sites. So I'm going to go ahead and start my slideshow here. So, uh, so now EPA uh, passed a bill, Brownfields Infrastructure Law, I think, was it last year? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's basically, uh, they put in a lot of money for land reuse. Uh, the goals, uh, which would be a bit different, apart from the money, what probably are different would be the Justice 40 initiative, wherein they want to put in, uh, invest 40% into communities that need it the most, so low income. And also there's a, a emphasis on you know, climate change. So communities, uh, neighborhoods that you know, uh, are poor are also most susceptible to changes in climate. And that's why th th that goal, uh, you know, the goal of providing it to lower income communities is, very, is paramount. Now, you all have projects. So when you hear brownfields, you think about, well, we don't have dirty sites. Well, that's really just, you know, if you, if you know you have a dirty site, that's part of, of a brownfield project, but you might have housing projects. You might not even know where the housing projects are, or you might have business or a, a business park you want to put together, but you, you might not know where to put it, or you might have ideas, might be a parking lot, but you can use Brownfield's funds for those types of studies. Because if you're an eligible entity like a city or a nonprofit or a state agency, you can ask the EPA for direct technical assistance or you can apply directly for Brownfield's funds. That's really as simple as it is. And if you don't want to apply directly, go to Travis first. And if Travis can't help you, he can probably help you now because he's got money. You can go to EPA, they might be able to help you. And if they can't help you, then you can come to us at CCLIR and figure it out and figure out if you can apply for one of these Brownfields grants. It's as simple as that. And again, if you have a housing project, especially non non -prof, uh, if you're a nonprofit or if you're doing affordable housing, or if you're doing community space, cultural space, restoration, that's all potentially eligible. So we have to find out whether your site or your project is eligible, if you're eligible, and if your potential sites are eligible. That's really the, the short of it. And just real quick, Ignacio, Go I just ahead. want to give a specific example of exactly what Ignacio is talking about here. Um, we just finished a current project up in uh, Flagstaff where we worked with a nonprofit, uh, uh, the Housing, uh, Housing Solutions of Northern Arizona, I believe. I might have that one word off there. But they took over an old hotel, and with using Brownfields funding, we were able to remove the asbestos-containing materials that were in there because then they're going to build out those units to have kitchens and bathrooms, not just a bathroom, because uh, they want to have to deal with trying to – because it's going to be uh, – I'm sorry, the final project will be um, transitional housing. They didn't want to bring in food trucks you know, three times a day to feed everybody in those 44 units. So they're going to put in kitchens, and they're – leveraging that with uh, the Department of Housing with Arizona, they were able to get funding to do that build out. So you use brownfields to clean it up, Department of Housing grant to then build up, build out the, the living units for this transitional housing. So now they're going to have 44 units of transitional housing available for the community in Flagstaff. So just giving you an idea of, of how you can use those monies uh, with other programs um, and just in that, how to address the, uh, the housing crisis that we do have um, across the U.S. Right, and the, what's on the picture, what's pictured, the left part of the picture, that's an abandoned, that's in California, it was an abandoned mill, uh, and what they did is, uh, from the wildfires, there was a lot of dead wood, and they're processing, they're processing the wood in that mill, uh, and that really just, ha that happened very quickly, and that was a non-profit that uh, got that grant. And uh, the solar you're seeing there, that's actually two types of projects. There's a job training grant in Richmond, California. So it's, it funds jobs. 
And uh, I don't think, is there a job training grant in Arizona? Mm, I don't think through Brownfields. Yeah, so, uh, you know, many states uh, all around you have uh, workforce development grants. So that's, uh, that's one avenue that hasn't been explored in Arizona yet. And that one, uh, the tower there, that's that facility in Nevada. I think that just started with the phase one. Uh, to the uh, to the coalition there, and it kind of snowballed into the biggest solar facility in the country. So that's just a couple of uh, a sample projects there. So again, Brownfields programs support redevelopment, reuse. It's not about finding sites and cleaning them up because you have you just don't find sites and assess them and clean them up. You have projects, and if your project is community related, has a community benefit, and you're an eligible entity, you can probably find a way to get the early uh, activities funded. And what those early activities are, you can do some planning, community outreach. Of course, phase ones and phase twos are very important, uh, and cleanup. Of course, that's the, uh, that's the main goal of uh, e using EPA money but they'll fund all the other stuff too. And or uh, if you are part of a coalition that received uh, a grant or if you receive a grant directly, it opens up a whole lot of other activities and uh, technical services directly from your EPA regional office. So for instance, um, there are grantees, they got a phase one, they got an EPA grant, and they have to do a market analysis. EPA has consultants in their regional offices. Different regional offices have different uh, teams of consultants who can do things like visioning. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they funded in California an infrastructure study to support EV charging in one county. So, so uh, they received an EPA grant as well. Uh, they funded uh, a corridor study of all the gasoline stations in one, in, in, in one county along a, a major highway for another county. Th those are what they're called, they have targeted brownfields assessments, and the, I, which I'm gonna talk about later, and they have a regionally directed funds. So there's a whole, and they kind of overlap too, it gets confusing. But the main point is you got to get in touch with Scott or Travis or me. So, you know, it starts, it really starts there. And there's something in the chat, so uh, if you can, oh. I don't know. If... So eligibility for all types of grants. If you're a state or a tribe or a local government or a regional governmental entity or a nonprofit. If you're a private entity or if you want to help private industry they can they can also uh, they can also um, uh, pro, uh, I, I would say uh, benefit from it but they have to go through a eligible entity I mean it's more complicated than that but you know <laughs> you have to get in the door first and then we can explain it long, uh, more because <laughs> uh, there's a lot of devil in the detail but that's what's uh, Scott, Travis, and I are here for. Now, what's coming, going to be announced next week, and I guess my slides might have the details off because it changes constantly, but uh, what we talk about Brownfields grants from the EPA, we're talking about MARC, M-A-R-C, which stands for Multipurpose Assessment Revolving Loan Fund and Cleanup. So, multipurpose grants is kind of that, that's what it is. It's like the Swiss Army knife of grants. Uh, and this is what uh, Roseanne will be talking about. It's, this is one of Roseanne's grants. Uh, she'll get into that. And so I'm going to pass that on you, uh, Roseanne. <laughs> but then uh, to be eligible, the applicant has to be, again, a city uh, or, an, an, I mean, the eligible entity and must own one, at least one site for cleanup because it will fund assessment and cleanup. And a whole lot of planning and community outreach. Yep. It's up to one million, up to five years, and it's basically uh, the goal of this is you know you have an 
a larger area or a neighborhood or a corridor, several sites where you want to do some really major planning. And that's what uh, Roseanne's project is about. Now, assessment. So this is uh, the most popular, the most competitive. And this is where uh, eligible entities can get funds for inventories, uh, phase ones and phase twos, community outreach, cleanup planning. You can do a lot of these studies, but again, some of these studies can be also be done by other EPA free technical assistance. But for this, you're, you're, you, you get the funds directly to implement this. And you can do the work with in-house staff. So if you have a, a city staff who are, you know, do community outreach or do planning, if you have architects or landscape architects, and there are project or site related, so you can pay for that uh, for staff time, or you can hire consultants. It's up, and so and uh, coalitions are up to one million. So coalitions usually are three to four with a lead, and the state led, which Travis will be applying for, is up to two million. If you're going on your own, because there are some communities there that have their own grants, I think, is UMAS a community wide? No, I think that's a coalition. It's so a coalition. Yuma, Yuma yeah. County. Yeah. All right. So, but there are community wides, which is one city can apply for up to five hundred thousand dollars. So, if Buckeye wanted to go in for a community wide, you can just go in solo mm -hmm. and apply for yourself. The revolving loan fund. So, Phoenix has one of these. The state used to have one of these, but yeah, this has evolved to it, it kind of changed. Uh, and, and Tucson has, has a brand new one. And so this is uh, where the grantee gets a grant so that they can loan and subgrant it to eligible entities. So loans are for private entities, and grants are for subgrants are for eligible entities. Uh, EPA really likes loans, but if you have to subgrant, you can subgrant up to fifty uh, percent. Uh, now there used to be a match of twenty percent, but this year it is waived, so uh, you don't have to have a match if you apply and receive it this year. And uh, again, there's a lot of devil in the detail, and I must say, you know, there's going to be a lot of webinars the next month, so. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm going very light here because uh, you're going to hear it again if I say it here. And so you might as well hear it from the horse's mouth and not from me, the pony. Because I'm the pony and the horses will be giving their presentations later on the, uh, next month. Uh, for cleanup, uh, up to, uh, to $500,000, I think it might go to $1 million. It depends. So again, this is one of those things that might be changing. Uh, you, it, you, it used to be one site, but now you can uh, apply for up to many sites uh, in one community. But you have to own at least uh, one or two of them, I think, when you apply. Uh, and again, it's for site cleanup, reuse planning, site cleanup planning, and community involvement associated with the planning act, uh, with the cleanup activity, and regulatory oversight. Uh, and the length is three years. Again, it used to have a match, but this year there is no match requirement. Is the is there a threshold for the no match requirement, or is that applying to all applicants? So is it just going to certain like disadvantaged communities, or will no? That's for all applicants. Okay. Yeah. And Scott, if I say something wrong, chime in. And actually, I'm very proud of this one because one of my first. One of the first grants I helped in uh, in Arizona was uh, the uh, Camp Naco. I was about to say the Camp Naco. Yes, Camp Naco. So uh, that's one of the first grants Seeclear helped get in Arizona. So, so for 2023, fiscal year 2023, the state lead up to four communities, two million coalition up to one million, up to four communities, uh, community wide five hundred thousand, and then. There'll be a multi-purpose grant, an RLF, and cleanup. So that's those are the opportunities. Again, the webinars are coming uh, 
this month. I think maybe next week it will be announced. And once it's announced, you got 60 days. So you should be planning now. And other resources. So uh, City of Phoenix will give you an example of what they do. They have a coalition. I uh, know they have a, a multi-purpose coalition. Coalition. Uh, you know, Travis will talk about his program. Uh, he doesn't have slides, but he can talk about it. Yeah. And then we have a couple of extra slides here on what the PBA is and what the workforce uh, development is. So, Roseanne, I think this is where you come in. Great. Thank you, Ignacio Travis. Welcome, everyone. It's, it's exciting to see that there are some folks that have uh, experience with brownfields and some that are just coming into the fold. I will tell you that I've been managing our Phoenix Brownfields program since it started when I was a mere child years ago. And we've had the opportunity to really grow our program using EPA grants, which have also helped us to leverage other funding for our program as well. So we've had a program, we're one of the first cities. We started way back in 1998 and have uh, had the benefit of doing quite a bit of good work, I think, throughout the city. And what I wanna share with you today is some of the work that we've done and kind of share with you a little bit of tips and tricks on how we've been able to really incorporate brownfields into the various aspects of our city operations. And I must say, Next slide, uh, please. Phoenix is the first community that actually had a karaoke in their booth for brownfields. <laughs> so if anyone <laughs> talked about brownfields karaoke, it started with Roseanne. <laughs> yes, we like to have fun in brownfields, that's for sure. It's a great opportunity to meet a lot of fun people. And um, Ignacio, a.k.a. Iggy D, is the king of karaoke. So next time you guys get a chance, go to a Brownfields conference and you'll have a blast. All right, so we've been going, as I said, for about 20 plus years now, and we've had some success. Our program is both offering assistance to our own city departments as they acquire land. We really are encouraging departments to look at ways to acquire brownfield sites. That way we have the opportunity to get them cleaned up and back into reuse for public and community benefits. And then we have a second part of our program where we provide assistance directly to the private sector. So we've been able to bring in over $350 million in private investments to about 80 projects in total. We've uh, restored over 320 acres of land throughout the city, and we've created or maintained about 3,000, somewhere between 3,000 and 3,500 jobs. We've been able to do this with a combination of EPA grants, which in total over the years has been 3.9 million. We've done a Brownfields assessment grant, a job training, or environmental workforce training grant. We've done an area-wide planning grant way back when. We partnered with ADEQ and City of Tucson on a revolving loan fund years ago, and now we have our own loan fund. We've done uh, targeted brownfields assessment grants. And the only grant we haven't done is a cleanup grant. So maybe in the future, we'll be able to do that. We've also been able to obtain our own uh, general obligation bond funds that we've used for the Brownfields program as well. We've been able to assist the private sector directly by providing funding, grant funding to them to offset the gap that they might have in the cleanup of the site. And they use it for public infrastructure, uh, permit fees, development fees, those kinds of things. So we've also been able to use that bond funding for our own city departments as they acquire land, use it for phase ones, phase twos, cleanup, asbestos, and lead-based paint as well. So the combination of those two funds has really been really useful for us. So as, as all of you cities and counties and COGS think about this, EPA grants are a great way to get you started. And then there's also other funding out there that could apply as well. Next slide. So I wanna share with you some of the assessment grants that we've done. We've done everything from uh, more citywide kind of grants to very specific projects. 
So our original grant started with the Rio Salado project when we were doing the Rio Salado Habitat Restoration Project way back in 1998. We had a $350,000 phase one, phase two environmental assessment grant that was really able to help us on the banks of the river as we restored about five miles of the river right in the core of Phoenix. We also did an assessment grant specifically for the light rail project that came in through Phoenix for those first 20 miles. Again, phase ones and phase twos. And Ignacio and Travis mentioned the targeted brownfields assessment. That's the TBA we use for some aviation property and we're able to get a phase one and phase two so that we understood what the environmental conditions would be prior to us releasing a request for proposal for redevelopment. So I wanna share with you that this TBA really is a great tidbit for you all to tap into because a lot of folks don't take advantage of it, but it's a great way to have EPA really hires their contractor. They do a lot of the work. Uh, the consultant puts the scope together, you advise with them and agree on, on the scope, and then the contractor goes off and does the work, and you come back and you get the report, and you it's a pretty simple process. The only thing I will say is it might take a little bit longer, so you just have to think about the property that you have, that, that you're not in a rush to get it done, but it's something that you need to know those environmental conditions. So we've had the advantage of not only aviation land, but we've also had a TBA on several other properties as well over the years. So a great little tool to use. We've also used our assessment grant specifically for end uses that are focused. So we have our Brownfields to Health Fields grant that we use specifically to identify sites that could be cleaned up and reused for food and healthcare assets. So through that particular assessment grant, we were able to clean up and redevelop sites for community gardens, school gardens, urban farms, and a food hub. So it really was a really great grant that got us started. And now we're actually working on one of the largest health fields projects, I think in the country, on one of our former landfills. It's called the Arizona Fresh Project. That's just a little bit south of the river. So uh, we'll come back at another time to talk about that project as well. So you can use it citywide. You can use the assessment for something very specific. Specific. Next slide, please. I also want to share with you that we have done the environmental workforce training grant. It's been quite a few years ago uh, when it was actually just getting started and it was still called the Brownfields Job Training Grant. And we did, uh, we pushed the envelope a little bit and looked at not only did we want to do training for environmental technicians, but we wanted to satisfy a need that was really urgent within the city of Phoenix, and that was for water and wastewater technicians. And so we encouraged EPA to allow us to do that, and they did. And then we also did some recycling technician training that was also a pretty hot commodity at that particular point in time. So I, I think we've been able to really take advantage of that workforce development training that you may not think of within your city, but it could be something that could be done. I know there are other cities that have used it for uh, solar job training as well. Um, folks get the standard OSHA 40 hour hazardous waste operator training. You can get asbestos and lead uh, survey and training and abatement. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. So that's a good one to look at if you're looking for some place to um, help your residents in your city get jobs. And one of the things that we did on this particular grant that I think is really important is that we teamed with our um, economic development department that had the workforce development training program. So we were able to partner together and develop a model that we could get this sort of training done because it was a little bit unusual, a little bit out of the box for them from what they normally do, but it worked out really well. Next slide, please. And then I also want to share with you that we have done the uh, revolving loan grant. We got this grant at the same time we did our coalition in 2020. So right at the start of, in the midst of the pandemic. So we've had a little bit of a slow start and I'm very happy that Patrick is here with us representing LISC. They are our uh, 
financial partner and funder funding partner for this particular grant. So it's $800,000 for citywide, any sites located within the city of Phoenix. We'll be providing low interest rate loans to private developers, and we can also provide sub-grants to nonprofits. So that's a little interesting twist to this revolving loan fund is that it's not only loans, but grants could be made for cleanup to nonprofits who are eligible. So there's always a little bit of nuance to all of these grants that you can find that might satisfy lots of different needs. In this particular loan fund, we're also focusing on some targeted areas. Rio Reimagined is an area one mile within the banks of the river on the north and south side. We have several targeted redevelopment areas and neighborhood initiative areas that are in there as well. And I, before we move on to talk about our assessment coalition grant, I did want to also share with you that one of the things that we did was always to think about brownfields in a way that we can integrate it everywhere within various operations and policies and programs and plans that happen within the city. So we have brownfields goals within our general plan, which I know every city needs to do. We also have brownfields goals in our climate action plan as part of that work as well. And we've been able to integrate brownfields within uh, operations that our economic development department does, housing, parks, public works, transit, lots of different places. Because as Ignacio and Travis had both mentioned, brownfields is, is more than just cleanup. Think about it as projects. I really love that idea that no matter what you're doing, if you're purchasing a piece of property, you're probably going to need to do a phase one environmental site assessment at a minimum. So you've got grant funds that could help you there. If you're in, already into a project, you know, you you may be redeveloping or rehabbing or renovating a building. You need to address asbestos and lead-based paint. So not necessarily something you might think of as a brownfield, but certainly something that you need to address as well. So think about it in that way. Integrate wherever you can and get other departments, if you're a city, involved in the process. If you're a nonprofit, partner with some of these folks that may have already done this kind of work because it really goes a long way. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Beth to talk about our Real Reimagined Brownfields Assessment Coalition Grant. Okay, I'm going to talk about our Real Reimagined Brownfields Assessment Coalition Grant. Um, the Real Reimagined was an initiative sparked by the, for, the late Senator McCain. Uh, to really transform the river areas from an area that had been neglected over the years to um, improve them and restore the river areas and make it a public gathering space. And so there's eight river communities along the stretch of the river and three of them are involved in our coalition grant. So we have Avondale, Tempe, and City of Phoenix as the lead for the grant. And so we can do phase ones, phase twos. We've already done inventories for Tempe and Avondale. Uh, we can do land use planning, cleanup planning. And the only thing we can't do is the actual cleanup. But uh, the advantage of the assessment grants is you can kind of do everything up to the point of where you would, would buy the property if you don't already own it. So you can kind of see what you assess it and see what you're getting into before you purchase the property. And uh, the nuts and bolts kind of of how the assessment grant works is the city of Phoenix already has on-call environmental consultants and uh, that meet the procurement standards of EPA. So we use our on-call consultants to do the phase ones, phase twos, um, asbestos or lead surveys for all three cities. And um, we can do assessments for our own properties that are already owned by the city properties that the city is looking to acquire. And we can also do assessments for private developers that are looking at a, at a site that's within our Rio reimagined areas. So it's, it works for private developers too. They just have to go through our consultor, consultants on contract. And so within the city of Phoenix, our Rio reimagined areas, we have the Rio Salado Habitat Restoration Area to the east. 
the Rio Salado Oeste and the Trace Rios wetlands. And then you can also see we have the South Central Light Rail extension going through the river area along Central. Uh, Phoenix has used a variety of EPA technical assistance grants and land use planning along the Rio Reimagined area. We did an urban waters technical assistance report for Rio Salado Oeste. We picked a city owned site around 67th Avenue and did a charrette with the community and other stakeholders for that area, looking at a city owned property that is a current sand and gravel mining operation to kind of see like what, what the community would is looking for in redevelopment along that area. And it, and it wasn't necessarily meant to be just specific to that site, but also there's so many landfills along that stretch of the river. It could be any, any landfill site and former sand and, ma sand and gravel mining area. We also have the Del Rio area brownfields plan that we did with an EPA grant. And that was centered around our Del Rio landfill um, getting community input on what they want that area to be redeveloped into. And we also have the Rio Salado Beyond the Banks area plan. And that was not done with EPA funds, but it was done through our planning department, really looking at um, redevelopment initiatives in that area. For the city of Avondale, they have three rivers running through their city, the Agua Fria, the Gila, and the Salt. And so in addition to their river corridor, which takes up a good part of the city limits, they also have emphasis areas of a health tech corridor and Old Town Avondale. And then the city of Tempe in their river corridor, they have three main focus areas uh, to the southwest of the river, the northeast and southeast of the river. Got. So, uh, Roseanne, do you pick up back from here or do you want, I mean, I think the size got a little bit out of order. So you, oh, I talked oh. a little bit about this already, integrating oh, the brownfields everywhere and yep. <laughs> so I'm okay. not sure what the next slide is going to be. It'll be a mystery. <laughs> All right. So really, I guess, uh, Rose, this slide kind of puts everything in a nutshell, actually. Cities have different plans. They're probably spread over different departments. So you, even within cities and, and the organizations, you have to go beyond your comfort zone a little. Yesterday, we were at Tucson. We had the housing, the environmental folks. We wanted the business folks in there. Uh, I mean, and, and they could all use it. And so there's there's really enough opportunity, lots of opportunity, just really making the connections. And it's great that LISC is here because LISC could be, if you're thinking about an RLF and LISC is, is uh, open to managing other RLFs in the state, then, you know, it maybe they should talk with Tucson because Tucson is starting up, just starting up their uh, RLF and there are other communities that are thinking about applying for an RLF. So. Work's already done. It's just a matter of uh, getting the right pe the people locally to implement them. These are Phoenix's uh, so co contact. Rio right, yeah, these are the Rio Reimagined contact list. So, and these slides will be available. I think we're going to edit down this presentation and make them, maybe send it to Travis in case you want to show it to other folks yeah, in absolutely. the state. And then uh, again, uh, we've been talking about the targeted brownfields assessment. Uh, this is where if you don't really want to apply for a grant, you want just basically you're a bit patient and you're willing for the EPA to do the studies. Uh, it's a very simple application. Uh, this is especially if you only have one or two sites. If you have more than one site, EPA prefers that you really apply because you'd be more competitive by then. Uh, EPA already has contractors uh, on, uh, you know, that they have retained, but it does take, you have to be patient. It, uh, you know, it changes with the seasons, I guess. Scott can tell you what the processing time is. 
uh, for doing a, a phase one and phase two. You can have, a, if you have a consultant already, they can help with the work plan so that it's streamlined, uh, but you know, they can't get paid out of this. It's, it's strictly the EPA's consultant. Uh, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, so I was going to add, as Ignacio said, a targeted brownfield assessment, it's technical assistance, it's free that we provide. We send out our contractors to do these environmental assessments on a site or two. It's um, if you just have one site or two, it's a really good alternative to getting um, a larger grant. Also, if you feel like you may not have the capacity to apply for or be incredibly competitive for one of our EPA grants, or you don't feel like you can manage the grant, it's a really good alternative because the applicant needs to be engaged, but the bulk of the work is done by the EPA contractors with EPA oversight. So I, did, I just wanted to add that I will put my contact information in the chat. I will also put a link to, um, if you want to sign up, if you haven't already, to our regional brownfields um, mailing list. That's when you can get information on when funding resources are available. Um, we are expecting that our EPA headquarters office is going to roll out uh, several webinars in the next month or so once the announcement of these grants is made. And our regional office is going to be offering some webinars as well uh, to provide more information on all of these resources. So if you want to keep abreast of when those will be and you're interested in participating in them, then the one of the best ways to do that is either um, stay in touch with me or sign up even better for our mailing list. And then I just want to make two other points that were touched upon. Uh, one is Sites that get assessed, whether they're under an EPA grant or through the targeted brownfield assessment program, do not need to be owned by the applicant. They, they can be a privately owned. Uh, it's just that a private entity cannot apply, but a city or a county or a nonprofit can apply on their behalf as long as the property owner grants access to the site so that they can be assessed and sampling can be done if that's needed. So it's the site, brownfield sites are not limited to just publicly owned sites. Uh, we do a lot of work on privately owned sites. And then the other thing for those of you that are just getting your feet wet in brownfields, um, a brownfield, just to kind of give you a quick definition, is a site that is potentially contaminated. And we're not talking about huge contamination like a super fun site, but we're talking um, more like hazardous substances or petroleum contamination on the site, or it might just be perceived as contaminated often we will do an assessment or you will do an assessment under a grant and nothing is found. And that is great because now all the questions around that site have been cleared up and there's probably it's probably more appealing to potential investors or developers or clears the way for a public entity to acquire the property and develop it without any liability. So I just wanted to make that share that quick definition because um, I think a lot of times when we think of brownfield sites, we think of very complicated contaminated sites and most of them, the vast majority are not, and many are not contaminated at all. So again, these are vacant lots. These are dilapidated buildings. These could be even buildings that are currently being used, but they, they you're considering a reuse for them. And you wanna get a sense of whether there's anything in there such as lead-based paint or asbestos that needs to be dealt with before any renovation. So thank you. Great. Let's see, do you want to talk about oh, wait, yeah. one, one more is a job training or workforce development. Uh, uh, Roseanne did talk about this. This is the uh, grant she spoke about that communities do have to provide for environmental related work. And uh, Roseanne uh, stretched the envelope on her grant and many other uh, grantees do as well. Uh, they, they get creative on what type of grants or activities they fund under the workforce development or job training grant. So uh, do you want to talk about your- I do. Yeah, yep. SRP, okay. Okay, so I will uh, just go ahead, talk about your SRP, because so, I don't have slides <laughs> for you. No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> so in, in for any of the cities here, please take note to what City of Phoenix does, because absolutely they show you the example of how you can do more than just 
doing an assessment and clean up how you can approach like Ignacio was talking about you can do projects so that's a really good way to look at it I will say for the state response grant that ADQ manages it is a little bit more narrow we do really focus a lot on just doing the assessments and cleanups um, that is the majority of work we do however we will support you um, in getting to these re resources like C clear and EPA um, if you're looking to do some of those other uh, programs so uh, the big part of trying to put this information gathering together is uh, on what's going on and what's coming down the pipeline for the grants is ADQ is going to make uh, another uh, another stab at the two million dollar uh, community-wide assessment grant that's only available to states and tribes um, in order to do that though we have to have very specific target areas because we applied last year and it was too broad that was essentially the feedback that we got it was what we, because we're the state we're trying to cover the state but really for the to be a competitive grant application we needed to have targeted areas and be more specific on on, on the details on those targeted areas so uh, my uh, my ask today is so anyone who's interested in uh, wanting to have uh, a community uh, in their area that to be a targeted area, um, please reach out to me because we're, we're, we're going through several places. I've been on the road. In fact, it was funny you showed Camp Naco. I was in Naco two days ago because I went down to City of Douglas and I stopped by to see how the projects were doing down there. Um, and, and then a couple weeks before that, I was traveling through Snowflake and St. John's and, and Springerville. So, I mean, I've been everywhere. And I'm glad to see that La, La Paz is on here because, um, you know, we, we still want to get up more out in that Northwest. You know, I've done a little bit of stuff with uh, Mojave County, but we would uh, love to do some stuff out there in La Paz as well, you know, with Parker and, 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 and Havasu City. So, um, so if, if you think you have some sites and you're kind of like a little gun shy on trying to put together the competitive grant on your own, um, please reach out to me. I'd love to include it in our grant application. Um, and because we'd really like to get that $2 million assessment grant um, here in the state of Arizona. Um, it'll just help get more funding here and, and free up the funding that we have through the state response grant that we do each year um, because that grant has the ability to do assessments or cleanup. But it'd be awesome if we could have another grant that just takes that assessment work and then we can just use our state response grant to really focus on, on the cleanup because we have a lot of cleanup. Uh, as you can imagine, um, this grant has to cover the whole state. And so uh, to cover a whole state, you could eat up money pretty fast. And that's also why we promote um, doing the competitive grants and, 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 and look to use resources like Ignacio and his team to help get you those competitive grants. And like I said, they, we've been successful. Uh, uh, and, and usually a lot of times if you start out with the state response grant to do one or two projects, kind of get your feet wet, as we talked about, um, then it sets it up to be ready to do a competitive grant. So I did uh, several projects in the Copper Corridor, which if you're not familiar with, that's like your Globe, Superior, um, uh, those areas um, over there on East Pinal County and, and Gila County. Um, and now they have a uh, Copper Corridor Coalition grant and the same thing up north um, around the Route 66. There was a project up there and we did some more projects and then again they did another coalition grant. Uh, Yuma had a coalition grant and they did another coalition grant. Cochise County did a coalition grant and they just renewed theirs. Um, and then also Apache County uh, just got a coalition grant too. So it can be done uh, and, and it's happening out there. But at the same time, uh, we know with, with the BIL and the additional monies, uh, if we don't get it or we don't go after it, someone else is going to take it. So uh, we need to take advantage of this time now to try to get those funds here into Arizona so we can do more economic development. So please, again, if you have interest and you're just kind of like not sure about trying to take on the, you know, we talk about work capacity, especially with other grant programs from other other avenues that you're trying to help your communities with. Um, and, and this was one that you kind of, one less thing you put on your plate and want to put it on my plate. I'll take it. Um, I know I don't need any more on my plate, but but I'll take it. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to open up the questions now. Uh, so, if you have any questions, I'll stop sharing my screen here. You can and people, you can put yourself off to uh, you know uh, show your screen so that we can. Uh, if you have any questions, I guess I'll start off. Uh, 
for uh, a question actually would be for Scott. Uh, 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 Scott, I was in uh, Nogales yesterday and you know, they have some activities there that are, again, are beyond what a Brownfield grant might pay for. It's more for something that an Army Corps might do for assessing uh, capacity during uh, after a rain because mm. they have flooding issues. So will will a TBA and or if they have a grant uh, are they eligible a regionally directed uh, grant do that because it's it's the floods that's keeping economic development from uh, happening. Yeah. So our TBA our targeted brownfield assessment program would not that would not be a, a good fit for what you're describing we also have as ignacio said a, a smaller funding source called land revitalization technical assistance and that is again epa contractors that can do different sort of planning or feasibility studies um, around a particular brownfield site so it, it is possible um, that we might be able to do some work around flooding, um, flood resilience, uh, not knowing all the details, but again, it would have a brownfield site. And again, a brown, the definition of a brownfield site is fairly broad. It, it would need to involve a brownfield site. So it'd be one of those situations where we would need to um, have further conversations. And then just to follow that up, and I don't know if Roseanne, if there's anything you can speak to it, because I know out of Washington, DC, there was uh, resiliency studies being done and do you know out of those talks that there was a funding that might be made out of those coming out of that that study on resiliency for communities as I was thinking about your your request here I think there might be funding from other not necessarily brownfields but they could be coming uh, from some of those climate initiatives through other agencies we'd have to know a little more specifics about that site and the intended use. And it, it could be directly Corps of Engineers, but I, I'm just thinking there's probably another agency that might be able to provide that support. But again, you have to get into the program to, to ask. So don't be shy. <laughs> Are there any questions? You can put the question in the chat if you don't want to uh, to do it verbally or you just raise your hand. So uh, now's the time. Anyone in the room want? Uh, okay, working with consultants. Let's say you want to go for your own grant and now uh, you can have a consultant write your grant, but you have to follow the procurement uh, rules of EPA. And that, you know, has been, I think they're coming up with clearer guidance and uh, and they'll, I don't want to say anything that will uh, will not be 100% consistent with the policy. So best thing to do is attend those webinars with, that EPA will host and ask them directly. I, I want to work with the consultant to write my grant. How does that affect, if I get it, what do I have to do so that everything is above board if I get the grant? Because that's been a, uh, you know, a sensitive subject. At the same time, uh, consultants do provide a lot of value and help you sharpen your message. And they might see problems differently than you do, your challenges. So it's good to have consultants on board. You just have to do it the right way. Yeah, I'll add um, the, the, a lot, not, not a lot. I mean, a good number of applicants will work with a consultant on their application. And we'll probably cover the, this type of information on our EPA webinars that are coming up. So attend those if you do have questions. Uh, but really quickly, um, we don't really have much to say about how you select a consultant to help you with your application. But we do, if you are selected for a grant, there are a number of requirements, including your own procurement requirements that would require full and open competition to bring on a consultant to do the environmental work that would be done under your eventual grant. And pretty much every EPA grant, a large chunk of the budget is going to go towards a qualified environmental uh, consultant or professional. 
So that's completely normal, but it does need to, the, the procurement needs to be competitive. And then there's certain restrictions that if a consultant, if you do bring on a consultant to help you with your application and many, if not all, will often do it. Um, well, there's some arrangements for some consultants will do it free. Um, there, there's just some details to consider um, should that happen. And there's also some limitations on what they can share with you um, as far as putting your application together. So it's, it's very common, but just be aware there are just some, some limitations and we could answer some of those questions. Okay, anyone out there wanting to join a coalition or out oh, there? <laughs> Go ahead. You're muted. So uh, my name is Ursula. I'm with the city of Tucson. And I'm interested what the relationship is with the financial institution. Do they only administer the loans or would they administer, administer the whole fund for RLF? Or how does Phoenix uh, manage that relationship? So that question might be for Roseanne and or for Lisk. <laughs> so for our revolving loan fund, prior to the grant application, we reached out to Lisk to get their interest and agreement to participate as our fund manager. So we were actually wrote them into the grant application and their roles and responsibilities fall to um, actually helping us craft the eligibility requirements and borrower requirements, the application process, and they would collect the applications, uh, do the underwriting and make those selections. So work, work on that criteria together, but it would be their responsibility to do that. And then they would also be acting as the bank. So they would be able to provide those payments to the, the borrower at whatever schedule that we um, intended to do. And so as part of their work, and what's allowed in the grant, they are getting paid a fee to help manage all of that. So all of their labor and staff and all of that that's required to manage the loan fund is um, eligible for a cost requirement in the grant. And, and so that's how it's working. And unfortunately, like I said, we've moved a little bit slow, so we haven't quite finished everything up so we can start lending, but we hope to ramp up very quickly uh, because there's a lot of interest right now in Phoenix, particularly along the river, where there are the last expa uh, expanses of industrial land that a lot of folks are eyeing. And we know that because of past historical uses, there potentially are gonna be a lot of environmental conditions. Yeah, a word about the RLFs. There are the successful RLFs. Uh, there are many uh, in the country, and uh, they're successful because they make a few loans and then they get supplemental funding. Uh, I think there are some communities that have had five, six, seven, eight million dollars in supplemental funding, or even maybe even more. Now, uh, it is a five-year grant and it can be extended or sometimes, depending on EPA, they, they might want you to sunset that, close it out and then start a new one. But it's, the goal is to start one first and then you can figure out whether you, how much more money you need and, and, and how to work it out with EPA. Hey, this is, uh, this is Pat at Lisk. I just wanna, in defense of the city of Phoenix, moving a little slow on this, um, in between uh, this, uh, loan fund being approved and today was uh, COVID uh, and those there's a lot of resources as we all know that came out uh, related to COVID that had a much tighter clock on them and we've been working with um, various departments of the city of Phoenix on those funds. Hey, I, they spoke already so Irene is with, with Tucson folks. Any other questions? Yes, I have, oh, another, I have another question. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Oh. First of all. Okay. The question is, uh, the supplemental funds you're talking about, what are those? Where do they come from? Uh, well, uh, 
if an RLF is successful in making loans or subgrants, uh, EPA will uh, have a separate solicitation for current RLF grantees that are eligible to apply for supplemental. So make your loans, and then if you run out of money, then uh, the supplemental will be your uh, gateway to more funds. Any other questions? We got lots of time, but if people are uh, kind of still thinking, you know, you can just reach out to Scott or Travis or me. Stay tuned for the webinars because there's going to be a lot of detail thrown at you. Uh, we didn't want to do the detail detail here and just kind of let you say, "Oh, this is too much." No, <laughs> but uh, but it is a great program. As you see, Phoenix has had this for many many years and they passed a geo bond i think they're one of the few communities that ever have ever done this so kudos to roseanne and i think you did one are you doing another we actually did two geo bonds one in 2000 and it was just for city projects and it was really successful so in 2006 we were able to do funding for both private sector projects and city projects and actually, we're doing another one. Finally, the city is doing another geo bond program. We're going through the process right now, and our brownfields funds for this particular bond will be focused on real reimagined. So we'll be doing it yet again. It's really a great resource to kind of augment those places where EPA funds can't pay for things, but using your geo bond money, you can pay for the development needs that often the private sector has. Yeah, so the, the, the webinar, so that you're not, uh, know what to expect, EPA will have their own uh, webinars. They might have one or two because they're coming up with a lot of money, so they might actually split it up. Uh, CCLEAR will have, we'll have one of our own just for competitiveness again, make yourself. We're not going to go through the guidelines so much as we are how to get ready. Uh, and then uh, your regional offices will also have uh, webinars and the other tabbers because CCLEAR is a technical assistance provider for region 9 and 10 and there are six other, uh, five others so uh, you can spy on your competition and see what they're <laughs> peddling so there's a lot to look at <laughs> uh, to see what everyone's doing but again there is I don't think it's going to be as competitive because there's a lot of money but at the same time I could be wrong <laughs> And one last plug, if um, you would like the state of Arizona to include you as a target area in their grant application, please talk to Travis. Actually, uh, anyone, because if Travis gets like a dozen, he might say, okay, maybe uh, your region in the state can apply for a coalition if, mm -hmm. if he can't take you on. 